Um, well, we have a second reading for tonight and the last one in Los Angeles. The next one is with Mark von Schlegel and I will quickly introduce Mark. Mark von Schlegel is the author of 11 published books of fiction and criticism and numerous stories, scripts, essays and experimental short form writings. His first novel, Venusia, semiotext to 2005, was honors listed over the otherwise prize in science fiction. He holds a PhD in English and American literature from New York University. He has taught literature and art at NYU, CalArts and the San Francisco Art Institute and Städelschule Frankfurt. His criticism has appeared in Art Forum, Texte zur Kunst, Moose, Specs and the New York Review of Science Fiction. Welcome, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to re read to you a uh, short story that I just finished a few days ago. Um, it is titled Return of the Blue Carrot. Uh, it involves some characters I've written about before, and um, they're engaged in a sort of eternal war of time travel between one side that's basically fascist and one side that's fighting them. Um, and it goes back and forth who has the power all the time and can... And this is one more episode in that struggle. Return of the Blue Carrot. And it begins with a, an epigram or a, a little quotation from a manual from the corporation Time X, which is a time travel corporation in the future. And this is from their greetings agent section of their tutorial number two. Um, and it says, local memory by definition, will decohere. The special operative will always direct rate and direction of fall by means of intuitions improperly understood at the time. But among the fragments of perception, always the special op in the elasticity must know and taste timeline zero for what it is, namely home sweet home. Then the story is made up of a bunch of fragments And uh, I will, I decided I will say stop between them so you know when the new one's beginning. This is the first one. Wear the white and black. Be entrusted with the Abbey's gold. Be passing through the woods after sunset alone. Darkness gathers ominously in the ancient trees. How stupid can you get, dot JPEG? Take a turn to find way is blocked by a score of mounted warriors. Please, God, please, God, please, God, please. Helmeted leader approaches you on a cocky steed. Dirty mail glistens like fire in the falling sun. Tyrene copper-colored silver fish. Ragged tunic of green imbued with three orange diamonds and a blue proboscis. Mechanical head emits a voice. You ride to the Abbey on the Rhine? The abbot himself has entrusted, there is a toll tax on this road, villain, your baggage will suffice. But these bags belong to the Holy Church by grant. Shut thy foul and lying mouth, false cleric, debased vulgar. Dost thou defy Gabriel de Bagatelle? The knight draws his sword, dropandrun.com. Stop. Glenn walked slowly along the darkened sidewalk, deep in his own thought. Wasn't he supposed to remember something? He hadn't found the beacon, damn it. The air had grown colder. It was the wind from the ocean. The yellow sky had gone dark and there weren't any stars. His stomach growled. The feel of it took him out of the city for a moment. He remembered the town where he used to live across the Arapaws from here. Glenn wrapped his thoughts around his shoulders with his thin, useless windbreaker. The fork must be coming. Where was the sign? And there on the front steps to an abandoned brownstone, he found it. Stop. Doctor's office? Of course. The technology was familiar. Digital clock, typewriter, telephone, 
long playing record machine. A quick pat suggested the time phone was in low right side pocket. Glenn already felt better. Many observations came swirling into his already cramped brain. She wore big heavy rimmed glasses. She wore a skirt suit dressed like a middle-aged bourgeois of that era, according to his education, his training actually by the whole ideology of Time X and the HFH behind it. He naturally expected the doctor would be male. Was this variant Samuelson's needless attempt to outwit the revival? There was something cunning there, of course. So, she said, where were we? That's a good question, Glenn said. I can't answer you. I'm sorry, I was elsewhere when at all possible, stick to the truth. She sat at right angles to him at her desk. The lamp burned an incandescent bulb. She, he felt her eyes on his face. Why was he nervous? You really have no idea what we were just talking about. You seemed quite impassioned moments ago. This was good. The stream must be allowed to flow. But what sort of patient did she believe him to be? Those able to trade most easily out with the chrononaut were the mentally ill, grade A lunatics preferred, which meant that she was a professional psychiatrist most likely, and she might at least pretend to accept the truth from these lips. That was all he needed. For the ability to embody sanity and in insane conditions distinguished the special op in the field. Glenn spoke calmly, matter-of-factly, as much so as it was possible to speak. Let's say I just got here, he said. I replaced whomever was seated here talking to you, and I mean their entire life stream, with my own. So that explains why you stopped speaking in mid-sentence? I'm trained so that with techni technological access, I can intersect with any given brain from the tree of life to which we are all attached, even you. And once I've interacted, it all depends on the flow of the moment. Why here, my office? And why tell me the truth? Honestly, I'm still understanding these things and I don't have time to dissemble. I can't look back. I must only continue looking outwards from a reality fully streamlined with this possibility field afforded this station and I must make appropriate decisions and statements along its previously broadcast waves. Her pencil made stroking sounds on the rough cream paper and then came to a stop. By station, did you mean body? He was surprised she could actually follow him. Yes. What year is this, she asked. He hadn't managed to see his time phone screen, so he said out of the blue, 1987. He put it out like a gambit, 10 years off target. The pencil dashed. What year were you born? This was the perfect question, and sure enough, he felt the buzzing on his leg. The time phone in this era general, generally swapped out with a male wallet, particularly sensed in these tight artificial trousers. Goodbye, Glenn said. It was nice talking and answered the call. Stop. Nova Amsterdam Hospital, 1977. Smelled sour, like an enormous ancient spittoon. For the most part, the way to obstetrics was as solemn as the expressions on the faces of the frightened sisters and lurking males, as shabby and long used. Somewhere very near a woman was moaning in extraordinary pain. Glenn stopped by a greasy window and looked through at a group of five newborn babies receiving varied forms of special care. He let his eyes pass over and noticed only two boys. Eye contact with neither caused a fork. Glenn was not an emotional person. His very identity was to come and go, never stay still. One was always on the way to somewhere else more important, timeline zero. Of course, this was not it. Why would he panic? Glenn had no doubt he could generate an anomaly and create a fork from this fall. Can I help you? He approached the station casually. Was it his imagination? The nurse's eyes reached out with more than ordinary interest. She seemed a bright and sunny person, only partially enshadowed by the oblong world. I could actually be my own father, he said to her. Isn't that odd? It didn't faze. Are you looking for a particular child? Do you have a list of names? Ours don't have first names yet. She kept looking in his eyes. He knew what this was, most likely. We come from different layers of the Arapaws, he said. 
This is mutual fascin fascination. It's natural. An eyebrow lifted high, signifying what it was impossible to say. A sudden silence in the ward was now pierced by a baby's ragged cry. Your name's Glenn, isn't it? Was she the doctor? A sudden fear, not the first of the day, pierced him. He felt vibration against his left breast. The pure field of the time phone's natural resonance came like a sweet rain on the drought of his anxiety. Stop. Intuitions were kicking in, and as they did, memories unstacked. Glenn composed himself, remembering not to smell or taste or attempt to know the body he occupied at all. But intuition said, danger. Glenn, are you back? Back? With the doctor? The office felt strange, familiar, but the doctor was still a woman and she wore hexagonal glasses. Back? How could I be back? Had he bounced and returned? A quick pat suggested a loaded low right side pocket. The hands on the clock pointed to 147. I just asked. Ask me something else, he said easily. Okay, let's see. Why do you speak perfect colloquial English? What? If you come from all that time in the future, how is it that you can communicate? Because this brain, this head, this mouth speaks for me. The reason I'm back here with you again, if that's what happened, is because my supervisor, Samuelson, is an idiot. Someone hasn't gotten me out of the pot at the right time. So why come here, Vespuzia, 1977? Did you say 1977? I did. Do you smoke mere stool, by the way? No. Did she say mere stool? Vespuzia? Come to think of it, the office smelled strange. So you're alive now twice in two presents simultaneously, she said. We're all alive many, many times, he answered. A million, million mouths at once, connected like an infinity mirror. His mouth spoke in time contour, and he could almost see it. It must be hard, she said, for you to talk to people in the past. You must think we're inferior to you. This was true, despite having trained against pride in the fact Glenn knew he was superior when he talked to her. What sort of doctor was this, anyway? Her questions worried him, and why would he or his surrogate be visiting such a person in such a clearly out-of-the-way office? The room was dark, anonymously featured. She was clearly not the sort of professional time X typically targeted. This was more like the writer's office. He hadn't been directed to the writer in this mission. The book in your right side pocket, she said. May I see it? Book? Instinctively, sliding his hand into that silky lined cranny to grip the time phone, Glenn went hollow in shock, for it was not the time phone. It was a paperback book. In most earths of the books, the writer took the books that Time X brought them. They then published them into the current timeline to identify it forever. The Blue Carrot by C.A. Stearn, the improbable title and the ridiculous cover physically sickened him. He handed it over to her almost gratefully. The body almost leaped from the chair in horror when her norm phone rang. It's for you, she said. You lost your time phone. This is the voice on the phone. True. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to say stop there. Stop. <laughs> stop. It's for you, she said. You lost your time phone, says the voice. True. His pockets were all empty. Well, thanks to you, no doubt. You know how difficult it was to place this call? You know how much probability this has cost? Are you in pod? How can you be? I'm in pod. Don't ask what you can't comprehend. You just gave the phone away. You realize an untended time phone can double as a demolator. Get it back. He looked at the writer, still examining the book in her hands. What are you actually saying? Someone tricked you into handing over your time phone. I can't remember by definition, but the phone tells us the time and place which is there precisely three minutes ago. I want to talk to the old man. What? One-on-one, -on -one, I demand it, put him on. You're nuts, you think I'm here for the goodness of my fucking heart? All our lives are on the line here, you nitwit. Glenn hung up on himself. He still remembered a surprising amount. He remembered the writer would be the only one who could, who would believe in the agent. I never wrote this book, she said. She turned it around. The portrait on the back cover was of herself, complete with the hexa hexagonal glasses. The term blue carrot meant nothing to him, worse than nothing. It actually sickened him for some reason. C.A. Stearn, 
an inexplicably loathsome name. It's not a book, he told her. It's a dangerous radioactive projection. Give it back to me immediately. Really? He took the book hungrily like a hound takes the throat. Stop. It's almost over. Brother Glenn had never traveled this far east from his cell. He should have felt blessed at all to be a servant of the Abbey and trusted on such a mission. But these were indeed the end days. He arrived in Magdeburg on a raging day. There had been an all-night breaking and a destruction of a commune, and the town was smoldering still. Ruffians stood about in doorways, brandishing clubs, grasping strings of beads and golden goblets. Fallen women given over to thugs prolonged the night with foreheads bare, tossing epithets and refuse drunkenly from narrow windows. Just another Magdeburg morning. As Glenn led his party along the old Roman road, he was shocked to see rows of human heads staking the way to the cathedral. When he arrived at the unfinished site, he found work had ceased on the construction. But the beggars lining up around the one functional nave were a fright to behold. Glenn oversaw the tying of the beasts to village stakes. He hoisted the sacks of the abbey's tribute onto his own and his villain's shoulders. They passed through a gauntlet of soldiers into a tented, flame-lit interior. A long queue snaked out from the altar. The scent of frankincense snaked silkily through odour of rot and human filth. All sorts stood waiting to give various tribute to the bishop. After hours in line, Glenn presented his sacks and his letter from the abbot. Flanked by helmeted men-at-arms, the archdeacon proved as rough as speech as a visage. What am I supposed to do with all that bribe here, you fool? Magdeburg is dangerous right now. Do you want to draw unnecessary attention to the bishopric at this time? You will have this money counted, and then you shall return it to your abbot at once. The bishop comes to the abbey for St. Martin's Day and will pick it up then privately, if he is inspired. And be assured, we will hold your abbey responsible for every farthing. Stop. The yellow pages had gone dark. Glenn shut the book. There weren't any stars. He'd emerged from the underground, nearer fear than ever for reasons he no longer remembered. He moved along the darkening way. The air had grown colder. The wind came from the north, no longer tasting of ocean. It took his mind out of the city for a moment, suddenly, to a town where he couldn't possibly live. He felt ill. He wrapped his windbreaker around himself, homesick in the impossible, vertiginous fall. At a door stoop, he paused. It was not a time phone he found, but a shoe. Absurdly, he shook it to see if it was some hologram, a single from a pair of high-heeled women's pumps, unbuckled, there for the taking. Would the anomaly spark a fork? Glenn stood beneath the tall street light, fixed, like an actor alone on the stage. Green screen, green screen dreams, map screen mazes made the ground a long and glistening fold in the always something else. Fantastical vistas glittered from portals all around. Silver, red, blue-green color fields stretched into possible horizons. He himself rose among a field of text from a triangular cut far in the southeast portion of the distant visible. As he began to read, the fields broke, not horizontally, but vertically. New branches opened up into high backstories and low previews. Pseudo spaces piled up onto each other's surface until the illusion's history sparked into real depth. And he chased them. Words clarified nothing, though, but these spaces. And out of this widening nothing into his diamond-shaped hole, there now encroached a jagged, living, anti-orange thing. He could not stop reading. The proboscis of a mighty carrot, root hair not quite shaved, bounced into view. Stop. She demolated the timeline. Then she closed the door to abandoned rooms she'd filled with so many dreams and plans. The private rooms where she had plotted and studied and consulted and revisited for hours longer than eternal, a plot that had very likely achieved its attendant goal. Would anyone figure out exactly how and what she had done? 
She assumed the happy fascist hegemony, if that's what they really called themselves, would pour over every fragment they could gather for every clue. They would interrogate every possible witness, but she had worked alone without the aid of the revival at all, if the revival was a real thing and not simply a fiction Timex implanted in the agents. Or perhaps this was the revival. Certainly it had to start somewhere. She walked slowly down the broken stairs. Unless someone was waiting for her to emerge, today would be the proof the revival or something like it was possible. She did not pause before opening the sun-pained door. Outside, she stood on the stoop, entirely unremarked upon by a multitude of alternate points of view. Creatures took timelines into directions all about her. Trees turned sunward, birds raced to the future, but no assassins aimed, no messengers approached at great speed. The air from the sea was clear, scented even with Croatoa, she thought. Fleets of fleecy clouds crossed the sky en route to distant shores. Removing the wig, the false glasses, kicking off her shoes, she stepped barefoot onto the pavement, let the hegemony self-lock in self-looping lines. She must now be one with all the living, passing world. She must be the one who belonged. The end. Thank you. a little rough parts, but I can cut them before it's published. <laughs> Oops, Quit as you start. Okay, then I will start. Thank you, Mark. Oh, thanks, Jennifer. But you didn't left out so many parts, right? Did you? No, I read the whole thing. Yeah, the whole yeah, thing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was but wondering. I, there's some, I noticed some mistakes. It's very recent, so we can cut some. I will cut some things from the published story. <laughs> Or would I fix some things? Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, because I was wondering. Um, yeah, maybe just to to start, you s you said it's a short story, and I totally yes. got it. It's kind of a it's closed in itself a yes. short story, but then I was just wondering how you like usually write these kind of science fiction short stories. Are you coming back to the universe in the in the next <laughs> short story, or to yeah. Glenn? Is this a person yeah, who's appearing often? Yeah, so there are a bunch of Glenn stories, or sort of tendrils of this. This is only a part of where it's gone, but um, yeah, um, I was I've been working on that world for a while, uh, and um, even have been working on trying to make a kind of um, hypertext, you know, online where you can get, get click into different timelines and. Do that. I've, of Glenn's <laughs> <laughs> battle against the revival. So did and her name's, in some stories, Carolyn Azul, this woman character. Okay. Who sometimes is known as the Blue Carrot. So this was Return of the Blue Carrot. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like you have these short stories and then they might be a novel a day? Like, oh, it's good. Well, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, I think that's actually been a tradition in science fiction from since the 20th century, where uh, groups of short stories are sort of turned into books and, um, and then published then in different forms and then rewritten a hundred different times and improved every time. Uh, yeah, so I try, I get a lot of jobs for short stories or something, but I try to, yeah, organize them in a way that they won't just, because they're often in publications that um, are sort of for the moment and aren't not seen by a larger public. So. I try to make them work together in ways that can function later as a book. Yeah. You want? <laughs> I mean, there's this part in the story where the time phone is replaced by a book. Well, yeah. And I was one, I mean, you taught writing, you did even a PhD in literature. Um, so you even have a little bookstore. Um, what is a book then? What is a book to you? Like, and I was wondering, I was, I mean, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you have a time phone on the other side, what is a book? Well, I, my quick answer is a book for me is utopia. Right. <laughs> you know, they say a good book is, is, um, <laughs> yeah, I feel, you know, it, it can, for me, a book can break through into more positive space. 
Yeah, we had fantasy before. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking there, I was talking with a friend this week where we both agreed in our, we're both getting older. We've been reading this stuff for years. We're like, science fiction is fantasy. <laughs> yes, we had to admit that there. Yeah. You agreed on it's that. It's all the same. Yeah, fantasy and science fiction are really, I mean, it's a fantasy of science and the future. And that's why they are sold together. That's why they're same writers, right? The genre. Right. They're the same thing. Um, if you, if you not, I mean, you also show works in art galleries too. Mm -hmm. Like, how how is your um, art practice? If you, like, what what are you doing there? Sure. Is it maybe also related to writing and? It reading? is. I, it is definitely related to. I try to keep my practice related to books in a lot of ways. Like, I had an ex. I was in a group exhibition recently where I had two paintings. And one was of Agatha Christie. And And one was of the mother of Edgar Allan Poe. And then I had a, a selection of Agatha Christie books also. Is like, uh, so yeah, it's all related to, to literature some usually. Or I illustrate my own books sometimes. Um, or other people. Um, yeah, maybe uh, another question because you you might be really an expert in the field of science fiction. <laughs> so, well, um, I have a PhD in, in like Herman Melville. Oh, 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 okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, because I was just, there, there is only one date we get out, for, out of this text. It's 1977, right? Well, there's 87 too. 87 too? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. So that, then I missed this. But he was trying to be tricky by not saying 1977. <laughs> 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 but we yesterday we also had with Charlotte's reading the 70s and 1970s yeah. as a really maybe special decade for science fiction yeah. and you're referring on this as well and yeah. maybe you can just mm -hmm. tell a little bit more about this decade or well, why is it Charlotte so important I was saying that we call it the um, what's that, the new wave they sort of say the new wave. Uh, that was called the new wave science fiction from the late 60s to the late 70s or early 80s to the beginning of cyberpunk. And I think, as she said yesterday, it was this time where experimental writing and literary writing, very theoretically influenced, was also, you know, engaged in storytelling in this sort of public fashion in a special way. I, it was a really strange time where um, I studied it later and I realized that the, what we think of as this conservative less literary world of the pulps was actually more interesting than the literary world in, in a lot of ways because, and one main reason was actually a lot of writers were publishing each other. It was writers who were the editors. Yeah. And, it, and so they gave young writers mm -hmm. in the 60s a chance, like Joanna Ross and, and Samuel Delaney, these very radical young writers were given the chance to write books that were printed in like 40,000 copies. And they, you know, were 19 years old and they're 100,000 copies blanketing America of their book, you know, and no one got that chance. Mm -hmm. And, but they did in the 70s. This, these sort of radical older generation gave these young authors a chance to really experiment with the form. And as a result, we're still today very influenced by these works that explore feminism and gender and sort of ideas of today and post-colonialism and they were already involved with those ideas in this in fiction yeah. is that is that right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah do you have another yeah we have the last one yeah. um i mean again the the time phone book thing um Charlotte yesterday referred re to very uh, like a lot of like actual problems and realities we do have. She was invited actually to write about degrowth, came up with a timeline sci-fi um, answer. Um, is there moments in this longer text where you also react to very concrete stuff that we are problematically discussing right now or is like a time phone for example also inspired by our iphones or how does it work yeah a little bit yeah. I mean, it's a little bit about the idea of um the phone and the way it sort of insinuates into the memory and into 
into um, the experience of the present, and, and I think. But um, I forgot the first part of the question. Yeah, the first <laughs> part was like this: this reaction of actual or like of to oh yeah real. to the real world. Yeah, I mean the story. If you see, it's very subtle. Like, you know, this is a very maleist character. You know, and so it's very subtle about. It's not that subtle, but his sort of ideas about class and gender. And these things are, are built into the characters and into the story in a very quiet way. But it, then the, the narrative takes those ideas and sort of embodies them. It's a sort of a struggle between, you know, I call it in the stories the archaic revival against the happy fascist hegemony. So those two concepts are, are at stake. And the, 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 the revival is about sort of pre-modern forms resurfacing. Um, okay. And um, or postmodern, like super postmodern, you know, not even postmodern, a new era. And then um, the, the the HFH is is more like you know right wing control of information, and they're they're usually when you see people on that side of they're always using terrible language. They treat each other like shit in the in the in the agency and stuff and. They're always, you know, he hates his boss and this kind of thing. And so it's sort of, you see the rot of this system. And very subtly, though. This fiction, not not didactic sort of experience. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming. Um, thanks. Uh, Thank you, guys. Thanks yeah. to text. Zum Nachdenken. Thanks, Texas, to Nachdenken. <laughs> <clears throat>